The majority of Americans now say they disapprove of Israeli action in Gaza. That's according to a recent Gallup poll that showed a 14 percent drop in approval since November. But that's not to say Americans haven't always been split on both sides of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. People are saying that it's not terrorism and that it is justified because Israel is Israel. But if you look at what is actually happening, you don't kidnap, rape, murder, innocent women, children, kids. In Gaza, we're watching famine and starvation taking place. This is not what the Christianity called for. It's not what Islam called for. It's not what Judaism called for. Say there's a time for war and a time for My peace, friends, and it's, it's unfortunate and it's hostages. sad that this feels like it's, it's a time for war. The- people forget that these are real people. Real children, real families, real homes that are being destroyed. There's many people that we know that have been killed, murdered. They could not do anything besides sitting at home, watch the, the news and just crying. What we've been doing, uh, by we I mean Israel and the United States primarily, to the Palestinian people for decades is horrific. Israel is continuing to receive increased domestic and international backlash after seven aid workers were killed by an Israeli strike in Gaza. Joining us now is Chris Steyerwalt, News Nation's political editor and anchor of The Hill Sunday with Chris Steyerwalt. Chris, thank you so much to be here. It's great to see you um, in a setting that's not um, at The Hill Show studio. Um, you know, just to jump into it, do you, th- you know, we're talking about the Israel Gaza war. And just to start off with, do you think the Israeli strike on the world's central kitchen workers marks a turning point in how Americans and really the rest of the world view Israel's handling? of the war? Well, America has, well, first of all, thank you for having me. And it's, uh, I'm a little nervous because instead of being co-panelist now, you can grill me. So <laughs> I, I, here, here I am. Um, but look, America has a really unfortunate celebrity culture. We are celebrity obsessed. Um, and when Jose Andres, who is a celebrity, this comes close to a very famous person, um, Americans engage in a different way and start to look at it differently. And, you know, the, the, the sad truth, of course, is that there's so much, so much, when, when you have a war, there is so much bad that happens. There is so much suffering. There is so much hurt. Uh, and that's true, not just obviously in this conflict, but in Ukraine or in the, in the civil wars in, in, in Haiti, uh, around the world. Uh, the focus on Israel here because of that strike and because of uh, the uh, notoriety that Andres brings to it does change it. But I tend to think that uh, this falls more into the category of what we see with, um, tragically, uh, mass shootings. Mm -hmm. There's a period of time where people are really engaged. They really talk about it. They're really interested because there's a high visibility event. And then a week later, it's uh, I think it's it's back to the same. And do you think part of it, you know, part of we, we mentioned that Jose Andres is obviously a celebrity, but he has a lot of connections here in Washington. He's able to call the president and talk to him one on one. Do you think part of this has to do with his own influence? I'm, I, look, he, he's he's I'm sure quite a good lobbyist uh, and all of that. But you can't. There, there is no amount of lobbying that changes the political uh, predicament that Biden finds himself in, which is basically this. You have Biden's underperforming his 2020 numbers by 6.7 points, basically, uh, in the swing states. And there's two groups of voters in there. There's a group of voters who are uh, furious at Biden for his support for Israel, furious about this accident, furious about so many things. And they're angry at the president and they're disaffected. They say, I may not vote for Trump, but maybe I'll vote for RFK. Maybe I'll do something else. Maybe I'll stay home. And then there are the voters who would be extraordinarily displeased with Biden. And here we think about suburban Philadelphia particularly, but the suburbs of Detroit and of Milwaukee, uh, where there's lots of folks who would not like to see Biden uh, uh, cut ties with Israel or back away or, or do that stuff. So he, is, he has this fragile coalition, and the, the part of these voters who are not coming home for him right now disagree with each other. So that's, that's very difficult.
You know, on the Biden note, it's obviously no secret that he and Benjamin Netanyahu do not see eye to eye on most things. Um, Biden has condemned the airstrike on the World Central Kitchen workers and has said that Israel has not done enough to avoid civilian casualties. Uh, the president even hinted at a potential policy change toward Israel recently. What do you think that could, that change could look like, and will we even see that substantial of a change in U.S.-Israel policy? Well, I, I think I think it is probably unlikely that we will see that disruption in a in a significant way, simply because Israel ends up being too valuable of a U.S. ally. Um, the 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 Middle East uh, is divided into two two poles of power. Uh, one are the Sunni, uh, the, where the Saudis are the the leading power, and then you have the Shia and the Iranians on the other side. And Israel now, whether Israel is cast out of uh, the their good relationship or improved relationship with these Sunni states, I don't know. Uh, but Israel has ended up being a linchpin for the United States in balancing against Iran. Uh, and that has, we remember the Abraham Accords in the Trump administration, but Israel's strategic importance for the United States uh, has not decreased. And the need for a functioning relationship, a good relationship with Israel probably doesn't go away because of this. It's always so interesting to see certain foreign policy issues really um, permeate, I guess, U.S. politics, particularly during an election year. And we're even seeing this during the Democratic primary. The recent uncommitted vote in Wisconsin received 50,000 votes, and this comes after the movement performed pretty well in Michigan and Minnesota. How big of an issue electorally is this for Biden? Could this sink his chances in the general election in Michigan and Wisconsin? Well, you know, there's a funny thing that happens when you have close elections is that voters come to understand that maybe they have veto power, right? So we can think about on the other side, the traditional conservatives, sort of the Haley voters uh, with the Republicans, they think, you know, we could cost you this election because one of the, the problems that we've had in America is we've had so many close elections for so long, right? We haven't had, we haven't had a good gully washer come through and, and sort of reset things politically. We keep, ha we keep playing this game between the 45 yard lines. So if you are uh, anti-Israel or if you are uh, uh, staunchly in favor of a ceasefire, even if it's unilateral, if this matters a lot to you, you look at those numbers in these states where it's very close, right? In a lot of these states, you're talking about 10 or 20,000 votes out of millions cast. And people say, well, we could be enough to deprive Joe Biden of his victory, and then we'd, then we'd show him. But then the next part is the problem, which is, and you'll show him by doing what? shown by making Donald Trump president. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that Joe Biden is going to do, that Democrats are going to do, is say to these voters, OK, hippie, I hear you. Uh, <laughs> you're mad. You're very mad. Here's what Donald Trump has to say about Israel, about finish the job, about uh, his support for uh, an escalation in Israel. So if that's what you want, you stay home and you'll get Donald Trump. So we're talking so much about the Arab American vote, how it's playing in you know, Wisconsin, notably Michigan and the Detroit area. But you know, there's also the Jewish American vote, and you also have a very strong pro-Israel lobby in this country. We're seeing groups like APAC pour money into Democratic primaries, and particularly in the House. Um, you know, Cory Bush's district in Missouri, Jamal Bowman's in New York. Um, you know, potentially down the line, Summer Lee's, and uh, just outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Talk about the power of the pro-Israel lobby, but also the Jewish vote, because we know that there are very um, important house districts or critical house districts that, um, you know, encompass an area with a large Jewish population? There are more Jewish voters in the state of New York than there are Arab American voters in the entire country. Um, and when we look at Florida, when we look at Pennsylvania, uh, as well as a bunch of those competitive congressional districts in New York, there are lots and lots of Jewish voters. And one of the things that studies have shown us 
recent surveys have shown us, is that as Jewish Americans become more anxious about anti-Semitism, right, as we've seen the increase in anti-Semitic attacks and rhetoric and people have become alarmed, just watching what happened on October 7th has been so alarming for so many that I think it has strengthened their identity as uh, as Jews, as Jewish Americans, and it, it brings that issue to the fore. So this goes right back to the the box where Biden finds himself, which is, yeah, you want to you want to say soothing things uh, in Michigan, right? Because there are probably a quarter million Arab Americans or so living in the Metro Detroit area. That's a big number. But then when you look at where Jewish voters are across the country. They're in a bunch of districts. They're in a bunch of places where they're very consequential. And so the idea that there is a, a binary choice here that Biden can make to get himself out of political trouble, there isn't. There's just not, there's, it's not an either or a question. It's a both and. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, I want to move on to a much lighter topic before you go. I want to talk about your new show, The Hill Sunday. What can viewers expect and, you know, how is it different from other Sunday shows and other public affair shows? Well, I don't really know what I'm doing, so that makes it different, right? Uh, yeah. But um, what it, what we have, I hope, is a lot of what you get to be part of uh, frequently on the weekday show um, is a general commitment to the idea that uh, politics uh, is not about a struggle between good and evil, but is about competing goods, right? Um, that there are a lot of good things uh, that in a republic have to be held in tension with each other. Uh, freedom and order is the most, most obvious example, um, but let's take immigration. On yeah. the question of immigration, we, we need lots of immigrants in the United States, more than a million a year we need in the United States just to fill the jobs and, and do the work that Americans are, we don't have enough uh, population growth on our own to meet, and there is this massive demand for immigrants, so we need these immigrants. On the other hand, uh, immigration comes at a cost to, especially when it's disordered and chaotic, uh, as it has been, to a lot of people, including a lot of people who are uh, uh, on the margins of the economy, right? And those, both of those things are true, and they exist in tension. It's not one is true and the other is false. They exist in tension. So hopefully what we're able to do is talk about things in a little bit of a grown-up way that is doesn't get very often the opportunity to be heard on TV because people are looking for the soundbite, they're looking for the talking point, they're looking for uh, the marching orders for the week. Hopefully, we're going to talk about things uh, like grown-ups. We always love when we get to talk like grown-ups. We don't see it enough on cable news. Finally, you know, you mentioned immigration. What are some of the other big issues you're tracking? Well, look, I mean, the, we talked about we talked about another one, which is uh, reproductive rights, uh, elective access, access to elective abortion. So you, this is an election that for, if you want to think about how persuadable voters are going to make up their mind, you're holding in tension these two things, which is there are a lot of people who uh, are, are very upset about immigration. And this includes, by the way, a lot of Democrats and a lot of persuadable voters. But then you have some of those same voters who are very anxious about Republican efforts to repeal access to uh, abortion for women. And those two things exist in tension. And I think these are the two biggest issues that are probably going to... Uh, obviously, we stipulate the economy, the economy, the economy, the economy is always the story. But underneath that, I think this is an election that's about... Uh, disagreement on immigration and a disagreement on abortion. Absolutely. Well, Chris, thank you so much for joining us. And it's good to see you, uh, I guess, outside of the, the Hill on News Nation universe um, in a different setting. So, and I, I loved grilling you. <laughs> I'm glad I survived the grilling. I made it through. I can, I can, I can notch a win. You made it through. Well, thank you. And you can see The Hill Sunday with Chris Steyerwalt Sunday mornings at 10, 9 central, only on News Nation.
The official start date for the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is 1948, which followed the 1947 UN partition of Palestine. But depending on who you talk to, the conflict goes back far, even farther than that. Here to give us more perspective on this conflict from George Washington University is Associate Professor of International Affairs, Ned Lazarus. Ned, thank you so much for being here. You know, historically, uh, how have Americans viewed this conflict? And are you seeing a generational divide really play out in the way Americans are viewing it today? Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, historically, Americans have viewed the conflict, uh, you know, have viewed Israel much more favorably than the Palestinians, uh, have viewed certainly uh, Israel much more favorably than any of the uh, organizations, whether the PLO or Hamas, uh, uh, that have represented the Palestinians. Uh, and with the you know, broad American public, that remains true. Uh, but there is a, a very clear generational divide uh, that public opinion surveys have shown consistently uh, during the period since the October 7th Hamas attacks and uh, uh, Israel's war against Hamas in the months that have followed. Uh, and that gap seems to, uh, uh, it is consistent and it has uh, perhaps even grown. Uh, but I'm looking at uh, the most recent Pew Research Center surveys of American opinion. Uh, and you can see that uh, whereas American adults in general uh, sympathize more with Israel than with the Palestinians uh, and are more sympathetic to uh, or, or tend to see Israel's uh, goals for the war as, uh, as legitimate, uh, more of them than the Palestinians. When you look at ages 18 to 29, uh, it is often um, a reverse picture. Uh, there are more younger adults that sympathize with the Palestinians than with the Israelis. Um, and uh, uh, there are also among the 18 to 29 demographic more support uh, uh, for, uh, for Hamas, although it's, it remains uh, still uh, a minority, but more, much more critical views uh, of Israel's reasons for fighting and how Israel is fighting. You know, following the Israeli strike of the World Central Kitchen aid workers, President Biden has since hinted at a potential U.S. policy change towards Israel if Israel does not do more to avoid or prevent civilian deaths. If there is a policy change in U.S.-Israel policy, how significant would that be? Uh, it would be significant indeed, uh, because rhetorical differences uh, and even some very direct confrontations and very harsh uh, criticism is not actually a new element of the U.S.-Israel relationship. Uh, U.S. administrations have clashed with Israeli leaders, particularly from the right wing of Israeli politics and particularly with Benjamin Netanyahu. He has had very serious public confrontations with President Clinton, with President Obama, and now with President Biden. So harsh, uh, harsh words being exchanged uh, uh, is not actually something new, but a shift in policy uh, and a shift in uh, particularly this administration's strong support for Israel in the wake of the atrocities that Hamas committed on October 7th, uh, uh, th that would be a momentous shift, a very serious shift. Uh, and uh, it is evidence of uh, quite real and palpable frustration uh, in the administration. Uh, similar, perhaps, if we're asking about public opinion, uh, to, uh, you know, while, while the administration continues to say that the, the reason this war happened is because of Hamas, the war would end if Hamas would release the hostages. Uh, nonetheless, the administration is, has become extremely frustrated with the way that Israel is fighting and with the way that Israel has behaved in terms of uh, humanitarian aid uh, and the, uh, the uh, you know, accidental killing of seven World Central Kitchen workers this week uh, is certainly is a, a low point and may prove to be a turning point. Uh, the, the fact that the administration even mentions in public statements the possibility of shifting its policy uh, is really that is an escalation. Uh, that's not just that, that's saying we're, we we are not. Uh, this is not just words. This is not just rhetoric. We are very serious, uh, and uh, Israel is now uh, you know extremely dependent on the United States. Uh, it's dependent for the United States uh, for uh, military support if 
Israel uh, uh, moves into a larger regional conflict with Hezbollah and Iran. Um, it may also be dependent on the United States for uh, uh, military, for armaments, uh, if it is, uh, you know, if the war with Hamas continues, uh, as it appears to be uh, uh, continuing now, and the, Israel is dependent on the United States for political support. And the United States is Israel's really, at this point, last bastion of uh, political support internationally. Uh, so uh, yeah. the, 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 the U.S. administration, uh, you know, threatening a shift in policy uh, is something that would have real consequences for Israel. You know, the UN in many ways is responsible for the creation of the modern day state of Israel, but it continues to face accusations of anti-Semitism most recently for its very slow acknowledgement of claims of sexual violence against Israeli women during the October 7th Hamas terror attacks. Talk about the role of the U UN in this conflict. Uh, the UN uh, and Israel have always had a very fraught relationship. Uh, Israel does, absolutely. It is created by a UN resolution, UN Resolution 181. Uh, uh, UN Resolutions 242 and 338 are the legal basis for the Middle East peace process. Uh, and our, our, uh, and Israel you know, has, uh, certainly has accepted them from uh, uh, the beginning. But Israel has also always rebuffed UN criticism of its behavior and conflicts. Uh, in uh, the 1948 war, David Ben-Gurion, the founding prime minister of Israel, uh, famously said in Hebrew uh, of the UN, um shmum, that uh, sort of translates to UN shmuen, as in, mm -hmm. I'm not listening to what they say, we will do what we have to do. Uh, and that attitude, uh, you know, certainly continues. This is not unique to Israel. Uh, both parties to the conflict uh, will, you know, stand proudly by UN resolutions that uh, they see as in their interest, while completely denying the validity of UN resolutions that contradict their, their policy. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, what you mentioned, uh, and, and Israel also has long felt that uh, th the UN General Assembly, uh, things like the UN Human Rights Council are, you know, uh, systematically biased mm. against Israel. And they will point to the fact that on the UN Humans, Human Rights Council, countries that have egregious records of human rights violations uh, will pass multiple resolutions condemning Israel uh, without applying any scrutiny to their own records. Right. Um, so this this has existed for a long time. But in the current conflict, uh, there are two points uh, where this has uh, you know hit new lows. Um, mm -hmm. And one of those is what you mentioned, uh, the you know, the it, completely inexcusable and unexplainable uh, uh, you know, months that it took for an organization like UN Women to say anything uh, uh, or condemn uh, the systematic sexual violence committed by Hamas on October 7th, testified to by multiple witnesses uh, in, you know, credible reports that were issued very soon afterwards. Uh, and uh, it took months for anything to happen. The UN has in recent months, uh, both conducted its own investigation and held a Security Council session on the issue. So it has it has moved and it has done important right. things now, but it, to, it took months and, and, and painful protest uh, uh, for uh, uh, of survivors of, uh, right. you know, of October 7th for that to happen. That's a that is a definitely a new low. Uh, mm. in, in what has always been a very tense relationship. All right, right. Well, Ned Lazarus, thank you so much for helping us break it all down. It's such a complex and you know, very um, you know, heavy issue. We really appreciate your time and expertise on it. Thank you. Thank you. And I hope uh, for better news. Me too. Thank you.